Welcome to Hera and Josh tackling hot button issues. We're here at Psychology Today's offices on 23rd Street. Uh, if memory serves, a siren will go by at some point. So listeners, that's why we're, this is real stuff, gritty stuff. Right, it's New York. There's bound to be a siren every five minutes or so. And uh, we were talking about what topics to talk about. And the way we met was at Heterodox Academy's um, annual, what was it, a summit. Right. And talking about things like helicopter parenting and how children today, actually it was mainly about campuses, why yes. they're so divided. Right. And how people, instead of discussing things, they seem to polarize and yell at each other. And this seems to be, it's probably actually students who were, you wrote about in your book. Right. And maybe you can give some background. Sure. Um, so what I wrote about was the overprotection of um, students, the rise in mental health conditions among young people, college age being the flowering of uh, mental disorders normally, and this is when a huge, a huge rise in numbers is typically seen everywhere on every campus, and colleges are struggling to deal with it. And I first started reporting that about 20 years ago, and after documenting it for a number of years and realizing it was a phenomenon that was here to stay, I began looking at why. And why there's a direct uh, relationship to what's happening on campuses today. Um, and so the why of why kids seem to be breaking down in record numbers um, came from, was informed by many interviews with people on the front lines, which is all the heads of campus counseling centers across North America. Now, of course, the same could be said for other parts of the world, or at least technologically advanced segments of other countries. And what it turns out is that in upper middle class and above, there is this tremendous phenomenon of overprotection of the children by the parents. The reason's too many to go into. We'll have that conversation at another time. But some of the consequences of protecting kids uh, and, and worrying about their safety all the time is that um, kids never grow up learning how to tolerate discomfort. That's probably the single biggest factor. If you can't tolerate discomfort, um, every little stress is going to knock you for a loop and you're not going to know how to deal with it. And you have to be able to tolerate discomfort in order to have a conversation with someone whose views differ from your own because it's anxiety provoking and it's particularly anxiety provoking when it comes to conversations, political conversations about the way the country is run, the way your school is run, the way any organization vital to you is run. So toleration of discomfort is probably the single biggest factor. Um, causing people to not engage in conversations with others of different points of view. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, and when you say they don't know how to handle it, I, I think of, they don't know how to handle it, handle it internally, and so they run to authority, and so they bring the authorities in at, at the quickest moment. Well, the, running to authority is one way of handling. The other is that they just avoid. And, and don't have it at all, or they break down because the discomfort becomes too great for them to bear. Uh, so I see the things that make the headlines of, of um, yes. some school gets sued or sues someone. And, right. and then I also feel like one of the big consequences is that this makes great... It plays out lots of ways, we're saying. Yeah. yeah. And I guess I, I was thinking of the most headline-grabbing one and the one that the pundits are so quick. I mean, that's another consequence. It's like everyone can like point at the snowflakes. That's like, I feel like it's almost a cliche. Like, it's such an easy thing to do. It is. I agree. They're an easy target. Yes. Um, but I think there are other factors, too. 
And I think one, uh, and, and these may be even slightly, these are probably slightly more subtle, and that is that, so let's go with this idea of snowflakes, which is just an exaggerated term. It's an insulting for, term. Yeah, it's a very insulting term and, and quite exaggerated. But let's, okay, so let's haul it back into um, a more digestible term and psychologically fragile. Is that a better term? Okay, so we have fragile, so we have a fra generation of fragile people. So, so when you're fragile, the, the, one of the problems of fragility is that you don't muster the skills to the cognitive skills that can be deployed to refute all of the negative things that run through our heads all the time. Negative things have a bigger impact than positive things, and um, we all experience them, but some people get trapped in rumination over them. And it, it, it takes a certain amount of analytic cognitive skill to deal with the ways that we distort our thinking because of negative experiences. And interestingly... Can I put that in, can I put that in, in regular English? Yeah. You get a failing grade on a test or you, uh, someone insults you and someone who is not fragile feels bad, feels something like, oh my God, I, I failed, maybe. And, but then they realize they, they have some resilience, they have some, some ability to handle, to process that thought. But some people, when they get that thought, for whatever reason, they've been overprotected and they've never had to deal with that thought. And so when they're off on their own, they, um, they lose their shit. <laughs> right, they get overwhelmed with emotions so they don't have access to the thinking part of their brain. They're just lost in their emotional reactivity mm -hmm. um, related to not being able to tolerate discomfort. And so you, the, here's the interesting thing. So the, the skills that you need to muster, to maintain um, psychological balance day in and day out and handling all the little and larger vicissitudes uh, of life are exactly the same analytic skills that one needs in the classroom. They're the same thing. They're packaged in psych the psychological world therapeutically as cognitive behavioral therapy. But cognitive behavioral therapy, when you strip it down, is really just the application of a set of reasoning skills uh, that you're able to draw on um, when your emotional mind um, is quieted. So, so if you're psychologically fragile, you're lost in your emotions, you don't have regular as access to your, the cognitive skills that are gonna get you through a lot of difficult situations. And we've already established that having a conversation with someone whose views are very different from yours and have lots of different implications in yours can be really upsetting. So you have to have a way to manage your own emotions to be able to have a debate with someone or just forget a debate, just a conversation with someone. Um, no, but I wanna, I wanna make this a little more personal. Because I, I think one of the reasons that pundits like this so much and the news like, like it, this meaning they like to talk I mean if you go on to there are many news channels that will say like did you hear what happened at X University some student this happened and then, it's a cheap thrill so, it's a cheap way okay, of getting thrill. listeners so, riled up it, it gets people riled up even so how do you feel about it You've, you've studied this, you've been in it, you've, you've looked at it more than many people, but you're also not someone, your goal is not to rile people up. Right, My, the goal is to get people talking, actually, across their differences. So, how, so, how does it make you feel? So, you know, one of the things I think is going on is this, this kind of cheap shot, 
riling up listeners, which I think people do for an effect, some people more than others. They want people to maintain a state of outrage. Um, but the big problem with it is that it does maintain people um, in a state of, oh my God, you know, what's happening to young people today or in a state of outrage of the state of affairs on university campuses. Um, and well, I how, think there's how, a little bit of snobbery about that. How about you? And though? they don't, there's nothing solution focused. How about you? How do you feel? How do I feel about yeah. hearing? About the, the situation about students being fragile, about a generation oh. being fragile. Are you well, outraged? Well, you know, you... I'm not, uh, am I outraged? No, I'm not outraged about it. First of all, I was one of the first to document this, mm -hmm. so I understand it. I'm not outraged. I feel really bad for them. Um, and I feel that they're missing out on a whole lot of good things. Um, and I feel that since it's a whole generational thing, mm -hmm. I think that there are remedies possible and that there are my own personal belief, and I've said this many times, many places, in print and in person, is that I think universities bear a responsibility for, um, for helping solve this problem. Because it, if it's going to show up on campus, and campuses are places of education, instead of putting kids in therapy because they're fragile, I think it's more of a generational thing. I don't think it's an individual failing. I think it manifests individually, but I think it's across a generation. And I think schools can just do a lot to teach kids about the way the mind works and about how to counter their own negative tendencies so they can rescue themselves. I think people are much more resilient than they're given credit for. And I think most people have the ability to um, jump in and rescue themselves. So I hear compassion for the students because it's not, they didn't ask for this. They didn't, they, they didn't raise themselves. I vacillate between compassion and privately um, roll the eyeballs. Like I mean, a, a okay, because, yeah, I'll yeah. give you a perfect example, uh -huh. okay? Because I think universities are the places where the problem majorly manifests, and, and it's the perfect setup for coming up with solutions and applying solutions to a group of people just across the board, because everyone benefits from the mental skills of being able to handle uh, difficult and stressful, um, stressful experiences and difficult emotions. And I'll just give you an example. So you can either teach kids, you know, how to handle these things, or you can do what, I won't name the schools, but what schools are doing is take final exams. Everyone knows exams are final. Uh, exams are stressful. I don't think they're any more stressful today than they were um, a thousand years ago when I was at university. We had exams, we had blue books, we studied for them, and we bit the bullet and we took the test. Now, universities, some universities deal with the stress by putting out a call for puppies and having uh, animal wranglers and people surrounding the college campus to bring their puppies to campus for kids to play with. One, it doesn't solve the problem of stress. Everybody likes petting puppies. I have nothing against puppies at all. But it's just an absurd way to cave into doing something without really solving a problem. This is what I call an arch problem. It, an arch as in, a in a structure is um, it, it, it becomes stable when you put weight on it. If you don't put weight on it, then right. it becomes unstable. Uh -huh. And if you believe, if you see an arch wobbly and your way of making it stronger is to support it from below, you actually weaken the arch and the whole structure. And a way to strengthen it might be to put more pressure on it. 
And so a lot of problems, the, the, the solution, the, if you don't understand the problem, the would-be solution actually exacerbates the problem. So if the students don't know how to handle things and you coddle them, right. then you've now have, you've exacerbated the situation. Right. You may have mollified the, the moment. Right. But in the long term, it's, it's like Band-Aid solution doesn't even catch it. It's, right, not, it's a fake solution. It's, a, it's an anti-solution. Yeah, sure. Uh, I want to, I want to share why this came to mind for me. But I think there there are other things that are playing into it. Why, uh -huh. why conversations are so difficult on campuses that are sort of a consequence of this overprotective parenting. So we've talked about the ability to tolerate discomfort, and we've talked about the lack of mental skills that apply both emotionally um, and in the classroom. But I think that when kids are overprotected and they don't get out and they don't have free play, they can't go out on the street and just hang out with who's ever out there and have to devise a pickup game based on who's ever out of the house that day, um, kids lack social skills. Well, it's hard to have any kind of conversation with anyone else if you lack social skills. So I think the lack of social skills, which comes from being overprotected and not having free play opportunities, plays into it, um, as well as just being generally sheltered and not being exposed to a whole array of experiences. What's been your experience with have you interacted personally with students like this, or have you been on campus when oh, yeah. some some speaker was shouted down, or something like that, or both? What's been, all uh, of the above? Uh, what's been <laughs> what's what's one what's a, a personal experience? So um, a personal experience. I'll just I won't name the university, mm -hmm. um, but when I was beginning to do research for my book, and I was invited to speak at various universities. I would accept the invitation to speak with the request that I be allowed to speak freely for a chunk of time with students. Mm -hmm. And at one famous university, whose name is a household word, mm -hmm. um, in the Midwest, I met, went out to dinner with six students. And um, I said to them, uh, hey, and, and this school is kind of on top of the food chain of a number of schools in its class or of its type. So it's a, quite a selective school. And I said to the kids I was out at dinner with, I said, hey, I hear that there isn't much conversation happening in classes where you would think there would be differences of opinion and you would want to air um, diverse opinions, let's say comparative ethics or religion, uh, topics like that. There was dead silence among the six kids. And finally, one of them looked me in the eye and said, we didn't get here by rocking the boat. So I, I mean, that knocked me for a loop. Mm -hmm. Conversation itself, in which you might have a difference, and the difference might even be with the professor, was rocking the boat. So what you have in a lot of competitive academic environments or, or grooming for competitive academic environments is kids who are performance-oriented and not oriented to the process of learning, the process of discussing. It's, I just want to get the right answer and be done with it and get my A and get into said university. Mm -hmm. So that's another factor playing into How it. Did you, what, so what did you say? How did you respond? I was just dumbfounded. It became the title of a chapter in my, in my book. I was just so floored by that. We didn't get here by rocking the boat. I was just so floored, the conversation mm -hmm could be cons airing different opinions was considered rocking the boat. Did, 
the uh, by the way, we have a nation of wimps. I, I, I've wondered, are the wimps the, the students, the parents, the administrators, the whole The, the whole kids. Thing? The kids who so are emotional, who are not fragile, who are fragile. Through no fault of their own, they've emerged that no way. Through no fault of their own. And how do the parents and the school people, they seem like wimps too. So, so yeah, it's a, some are and some aren't. So here's the interesting thing. Whenever I would talk to groups of parents, and I spent basically 10 years talking to groups of parents, um, I would ask them, because free play is a really important part of growing up and learning things about yourself and gaining social skills and learning how to get along and, and, and surviving scrapes and actually developing a cohort experience and dealing with the stresses of a generation that work themselves into and then through play and get worked out through play. So um, um, I lost my train on that one. <laughs> so who are the wimps in? in so, so, so what I would do with the parents was I, so the, they've deprived their kids of play, but so, but I knew I could get to the parents by saying to them, hey, just sit back for a minute and think of the happiest moment of your childhood. Mm -hmm. And invariably, the parents would say to me, whether it's in a fancy auditorium, whether in the gymnasium, invariably, the parents would say, well, it was when I was 10 years old and I'd be on my bike and we'd ride off for the day. Our parents had no idea where we were. We didn't have cell phones. And the only requirement was that we'd be back for dinner. And that was their happiest memory from childhood, having that luxury of play for themselves. And that I would try and use that to tap into their uh, a, a discussion about the need for their children to have a similar experience. Invariably, the parents would say to me, oh no, but the world is so much more dangerous today. I can see it, there are more cars in the neighborhood. I live in the neighborhood where I grew up and there are more cars today. And you know, usually it's not car traffic, but just a general, sense of safety that parents have and I mean the data just bear it out this kids inhabit a much safer world today than they did 50 years ago it yeah it makes it not inexplicable that's why I feel like the parents are the wimps they're the ones who aren't facing their insecurities they're not they're not I don't the parents are super anxious because they know the world has changed since they were young and they want their kids prepared for this global world of competition, which may have been hyped a little bit too much. Um, and, and so they want their kids to excel on the playing field or in school. And so they push their kids and they, they take away play and they just put them on this very narrow path and overprotect them. And it, it's very hard to break through the parental anxieties. So they're the wimps. Well, I mean, yeah. I, but I, wimp, wimp is a, is a, that's a wimp loaded term. So wimp, wimp is a loaded term. I wanted to write, I wanted to title my book, The Fragility Factor, mm -hmm. and Random House wouldn't let me. They insisted it carry the same title as the article did. Uh, uh -huh. And, you know, I always thought the title was tongue in cheek. And for a book, I wanted, you know, a different title. But they wouldn't do it unless they used the same title. Go figure. Right. Well, it, it sold well. I mean, it, it was it a big made book, a right? It made a cultural, a cultural impact, let's put it that way. So, I mean, did I get rich on it? No, I got a nice advance, but I, it, you know, it didn't sell, I wasn't on Oprah, and it didn't sell a million copies. I was on Dr. Phil, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I want to tell you my experience. One experience of this for me was at the event where we were, and there was a panel, and on the panel was uh, a few speakers. One was Coleman Hughes, so he's uh, an up-and-coming, rising, um, he's, I believe, still an undergrad at Columbia, and he, I think he, he got really big speaking about uh, should we have reparations, uh-huh, and yeah. he's a he's a black student, and I think he was against it, and I think that's not what people expected, so I think that got him a lot of notoriety. Anyway, people, he said something, he clarified something, he said something very clearly, he said, if you if you're, mo- I, I don't remember exactly, I'm paraphrasing as, the best I can from memory. He said, if, you, if your emotions get intense so much that you can't handle, that you lose your, he didn't say lose your shit, but if you, lo- if, if that's, if you lose your cool, that's the problem. You're part of the problem if you get, go nuts and you know, there's many different ways that you can, if you don't know how to handle things, that you might handle it you know, going to the authorities or, uh, um, withdrawing or spewing on spewing, yeah, canceling oh, yeah. and canceling, yeah, doing what you can to get them out to like silence right. the other person, and so he said that, and then there was, um, should I mention her name? Judith Shapiro was the president of Barnard, and she mm-hmm. was on the panel too, and she said, yes, that's the thing. The thing is, I don't know what to, what do we teach them besides this. Do we give them another class in psychology? Do we give them a class in sociology? And I thought, see, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Looks like a nail. Mm-hmm. And if you are an academic, you think teach more academics. Mm-hmm. But I believe that what she was saying was a continuation of the problem. Give them another class. This is supporting <laughs> the arch right. from below. Right. And you're, it's the opposite of free play. Mm-hmm. And free play. So I thought. So I spoke to her afterward uh, briefly. I didn't give a whole lot of background because there were a lot of people who wanted to talk to her. And, well, you know, she, she was concerned. I said, we used to have, uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to say more fully than I said to her. I think that we, you, why did we, why were we not always so fragile? I presume that we weren't always so fragile. And if we weren't, why not? And I think Part of it was free play. That was automatic. We had recess. Kids mm-hmm. didn't have to be walked, uh, driven to school and driven home. And I was a latchkey kid. And, uh, and there's stuff you figure out on your own. Another big piece of it. Now, that we can give more free time. That, I hope that's automatic. And people give their kids free, time for free play and the opportunity to do it. And they'll get injured. Yes. And that's part Scrape of it. Scrape the name, really. Yeah, break a leg. Not I the mean, it'll happen. Yes, it does. Separately from that, there's how we teach. Not what we teach, but how we teach. Mm-hmm. And I think that by you know, we, we teaching to the test, there's a model that I believe what you're describing follows from, uh, is that people think more facts gives them more ability to handle things. And so if, if they just used to have to do well in the United States or their state, they only know to have no facts relevant to the here and now, uh, one geographical area. But now they have to know world history from beginning of, agriculture until now everywhere in the world and it's not possible you can't just stuff more in there yeah. are, it's a finite um uh thing and we i mean everyone and there is and time is finite too and people have probably read or seen you know if you're teaching ap history you have 30 minutes on this particular day to cover the french revolution and if right. you miss it that's it right you go on to the next thing and right. and so you're not, they're just getting facts and recalling facts. And I think that we used to teach, there were subjects that are taught, that have always been taught differently. One of them would be gym or sports. And everyone, we always have to distinguish between a sport that, where there's a coach that's telling exactly what to do and it's a traveling team and, mm-hmm. and if you lose, it's horrible. And, okay, I don't mean that. There's, I guess you could call it free play. Mm-hmm. But... There was an element of no matter who you were, you sometimes lost. And no matter who you were, you sometimes won. And you, after you lost, you still had to play the next game. And if you, if after you won, you still also had to play the next game. And so when you, and, but it's not like the whole school is at stake if you lose. And you would learn resilience and you'd learn patience and you'd learn to learn from your mentors and things like that. Another subject, or broad bunch of subjects, would be the arts. And I don't mean art history or art appreciation or music history or music appreciation. But doing. I mean doing, yeah. And it could be 
I'm, I'm partial to performance arts, so it could be drama, it could be stand-up comedy, it could mm -hmm. be, um, and it could also be something where you make stuff that you show, so it could be photography or painting or watercolor or sculpture, and if it's a performance art and you get panned or you forget your line, you gotta, you're on the stage, you gotta keep going. And if you, you know, if you get the, you're doing a music recital and you mess something up, you got to go through, you got to, you got to learn to do these things. And, but it's on a small scale. It's not in front of Carnegie Hall with the, you know, the king or queen and some command performance. It's, we all do it. And sometimes you paint a painting and you think it's beautiful and everyone says that that's stupid and, or your friends or whatever, you know, and you think, well, I thought that was beautiful and they don't. And you learn to look at things from other people's perspectives and you learn to stick with. So that doesn't seem to make the cut when we want to test them in everything. And no, it's so important to learn to fail early because when you learn early to fail and when parents let you fall and scrape a knee and you discover you can get up and, and you can get back into the game and that the world doesn't end. And if you get an F in something, um, you discover that the world doesn't end. And from that experience, you can build it onto a bigger stage so that if you curtsy backwards to the queen, you can still resurrect your self-respect and live a life. If you don't, and you realize that the valuable thing to learn, there are some facts and figures to learn. There are some things to memorize. I mean, I guess at the beginning, multiplication, you memorize the table. Eventually, though, you learn what I call social emotional skills of, I think you learn the stuff that you were talking about that the students today don't have, of you learn to look inward and find what's, what's missing in me, how do I fill that in? And when I teach in college, I have plenty of students who come in and from what they tell me, they, they say that I've never taken a class like this. It's project-based experiential learning. At the beginning, I often... I don't think anyone ever taught it. And I don't think anyone ever left deliberately left room for it. I just think, I mean, maybe there were fabulous teachers who did encourage people to do that. I never had them. I never um, had them, but I have seen it. I too have seen it. And I, it's not fair to say I did have a couple um, in university. But, um, but there was more space for you to do that. There was less there was less a um, parental push for performing well on every activity. Under Act the model of factual recall. Well, yes, that's just to... one of them because and 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 wanting to know the answers in advance. So using that model of learning, yes, which is the most easily quantifiable or the most easily measurable, yes. It's bureaucratically friendly. It's, it's, bureaucratically what, the bureaucratic, it's friendly. what the bureaucrats like. You Count can, the little black dots or, you know, whatever on the SATs. And, and the number of students making level one, level two, level three. Right. And, and we both have, I mean, we've talked in previous conversations that we've recorded about Sudbury Valley School and free prelate, learning that way. Now, I work with university students and I would like to, partly I'm interested in understanding the problem, but more I'm interested in solving the problem. And so, the, so I, one of the things that, only looking back at that heterodox academy meeting was that everyone there was academic, and they, most people there were academic, and, and the discussion generally seemed to be about understanding the problem. And I felt like their way of solving it was throwing academics at the problem, as, as that Judith Shapiro said. Not said, I mean, she didn't know I was, I don't want to put too much on her, but when I- She was not unique, let's put it that way. Oh no, yeah. It, um, I mean, she was saying whatever. She says. represents the academic perspective. And I think, yeah, I think universities are like, what do we do? But they don't realize- That I, it's not an academic solution. Exactly. And they're, they're, they're supporting the arch from below. So here's, here's a- Or it's like, it's like, um, it's not giving, if you, if you um, get it, some injuries, you gotta rest, but then you gotta do rehab. You gotta do, you gotta slowly work up the muscle. If, if it's mm -hmm. atrophied, then you gotta work it. Mm -hmm. 
And puppies is the opposite of working it. Right. Puppies is like, oh, you have a cast? Well, let's give you a massage too. Right. And now your muscles get like softer and softer. Right. And, or in this case, your mental, your social and emotional skills get more and more coddled. So yeah, when Jonathan wrote about the coddling of the American mind, I want to write about this, the, the rehab of the American mind. And so, I don't mean rehab like uh, uh, in the Amy Winehouse sense. Uh, oh I, yeah, right, right, right. I, yeah. Uh, physical therapy. It, it uh -huh. should be like social emotional therapy. Uh, right. Wait, physical therapy. No, not, see, therapy is not the right word because no. therapy in this context sounds like, yeah. uh, it would be like emotional physical therapy. Oh, like, or, or I'm not even sure therapy is the right word for it, but I mean, here's a thought. For example, um, let's use your model of workshops. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I really think this is something that could be done. And that is, and it just, it just takes a little time and not a whole lot of effort, but to take groups of people who are largely strangers to each other and just have them, give them a problem to solve and go off. And they don't have to know each other. Uh, they may be silent for the first two hours, but I just see, I don't think these so-called fragile kids are permanently destroyed. I don't think there's permanent pathology here. Okay, I, I do think they're it's they're really inexperienced. Mean. Yes, they're inexperienced, so they haven't learned and they haven't exercised lots of skills. But I think if you were to take a random group of people, have enough to form 20 groups of maybe six or seven, and have 20 problems to solve, and just say, okay, sort, you know, you're going to sort into the six or seven people around you, and um, here's a problem for each one of you to solve, and you hand out See, problems to each group, the problems, and then you say you have a couple of hours. Now, I think there's a bit more to it. If you just give them any random problem, that's not going to work so well. I think, the, I think yes, and the, the, the role of an educator... I, they're probably... You, you probably know better than I do. I think that you're right, that there are probably problems that are better suited to that kind of situation. But I think that's a model of how you get people to discover that there's something within, within them that they can muster. And you know, you don't grow unless you're challenged. Um, you don't adapt to environment. You don't get survival of the fittest. You don't get fit unless you're in an environment that requires you to make some adaptation, to learn something and to grow to meet the demands of whatever the environment is, yeah. which is essentially what you do in a situation like this. I think that there's a... Oh, it's still recording. Okay, uh, the screen shows. I'll let it that out. Uh, by the way, it's uh, 612, okay. so we'll have to wrap up in a minute, Yeah, I, I think, for you. Um, I think there's, there are levels of teaching skills, and there's excellent teaching, and there's not so excellent teaching. And just, I think excellent teaching is spending time, what is this class here for? Now, if it's K to 12, you can just say anything, because kids will figure stuff out. They've got to learn to read, they've got to learn to write. That's very broad skills. By the time they're at university, if I just said, uh, find it, create a problem and solve it, that's, I think, too broad. And yeah, no, my, I would hand out a problem, a my set role, of problems. My, I, I don't just, my role as an educator is to think of what are they here for? Why, why do they pick this particular class? So I have to, I have to empathize with them and mm -hmm. think of how to engage them. And then I have to think of a problem I think of, I have to think of a way to, I have to define the problem in some way that's not, I don't, I don't want to tell them what to do, but I have to give, I, it can't be, there are minimum levels of difficulty, but also maximum levels, and I have to be aware of how long it will take and things like that, so they can have an experience in the, there are certain, I have to deal with uh, how long the class is and so forth. 
And that part is not tricky, is not impossible, but it's, it's not trivial either. Mm -hmm. And in, in my experience, like it took me a long time in my courses to get that part right. And it, I think it only, it comes through a lot through experience in my case of the first couple times I did it, I, the problems were too vague and not really well defined. And, uh, but then over time they got to be where, you know, students, not only did they say I've never taken a class like this, when I'd first, you know, I'd say to them, you have to think of a problem that matters to you, that's going to solve, you have to, actually, it's a problem that affects people that you care about, and that you also care about the solution. And invariably, they would, not invariably, but most students would come up with a problem that they didn't really care about. It, it felt like an academic problem. When they would switch, and I gave them the option of switching if they wanted. So. After a while, when they started realizing that they could solve, they were going to solve this problem, they were like, this problem doesn't matter to me. If I want to solve a problem, there are problems that do matter to me. And they'd come, they'd say, can I switch to this one? Mm -hmm. And I would say, yeah, of course. And they'd say, I never knew that I could do something that mattered to me. I always thought mm -hmm. it had to be something that was abstract Why? and, you know, fixing all the world's problems or right. making a lot of money. That's called over-education. It's... I would say miseducation. Oh yeah, right. It's I'm being a little facetious. Yeah. It's, it's um. Yeah, if you if if you can only if there if what you take away from your education is that you can only solve certain kinds of problems or certain classes of problems, then that's miseducation because there are all kinds of problems to be solved, and one can bring analogous skills skill sets. To solving many different kinds of problems. When I was at a, a future heterodox academy event where Jonathan and Deb were speaking with a, is at Columbia with a professor, I forget his name, at Barnard, and they were talking about the problems. And when students, after when, at the Q and A at the end, when oh, they were talking with Scott Kaufman, that, I forget the name. Scott Kaufman. And when they want to get more Scott discussion Kaufman. about the stuff about situations. The solutions that they would actually give these professors at the front of the room mm -hmm. was they were actually giving them skills that were normal, the types of things you tell actors and, and musicians of how to handle situations like that. But that's not that what, they, what Heterodox Academy is proposing solving things with. I know. They're it's ironic, kind they of. They want to study it and they want to, and they want to get more discussion about the stuff. Uh -huh. but, but it feels, feels like it's like designed for people who are... They want to get their stuff written in Chronicle of Education and in the Atlantic and things yeah. like that. But that's what they're really good at. Yeah, but well, actually, it's the hammer they, that they have. Yes. Well, sorry, what? It's the hammer that they have. Yeah, exactly. And, they, and they're like, well, there's a nail. Yeah. But it's not actually what to do <laughs> no, to solve it. It's, I know. They just want to explore it from more and more different angles. Yeah. So Lenore Skenazi is doing something different. With, right. I mean, she, with K-12, she's got grow, let's, let grow. Uh -huh. And the homework assignment that schools that do this, I this is beautiful. This is like superior, use superior force against itself and go to let grow to get more details. But generally it's the student has to go to the parent and say, what's something that you did on your own when you were my age? Mm -hmm. That's what I have to do. Uh -huh. And so if it was go to the store and buy right. you know, uh, some vegetables, right. they gotta do that. But most parents don't let kids do that. No. Or maybe it's, you know, build something with hammers and nails, and most parents don't let kids do that. So now they have to. In order for the student to do well, the parents have to back off. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. I think brilliant. Yeah. So I was talking to her, and I want to do Let Grow You. So I don't think it would quite work for college students to go to their parents and say, what did you do no. when, I was, when you were my age? But I think it's, I want to create projects, not just projects. When you say give them a project to go do, I feel like it's like, to teach piano, it's saying, get your fingers on the keyboard. But you don't just get the fingers on the keyboard, you play scales. I mean, depending on what kind of music you want to play, but you, you, know, you start with a C major scale and learn from there. Because you have to learn what the notes are and what their relationship is to each other. Yeah, you're actually learning, you're learning the physical skills of where the fingers go, you're mm -hmm. learning to express yourself. You're also learning theory, although no one tells you the no. theory. You get it because right. the it's theory came from, the theory had to, 
The person who created scales. Notes are not random well. sounds. They have a relationship to each other. Yes, within a certain theory. Yes. And there are other ways of playing in right. other traditions and so forth. Yeah, there are and, other ways of tuning instruments. Yeah. And in this particular way, if you want to learn to play classical and rock and so forth, you learn a certain a certain theory. But you, if 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 you started, eventually you lecture the theory at them, I guess. But really, you start by saying, "Here's here's an, an exercise that emerged from people who are masters." People who have mastered this particular theory have given you this exercise to do. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then there's another exercise that follows that's a little bit more advanced and so on. And so if you want, I teach leadership and I teach entrepreneurship. And so I give people, here's something that masters, leader, expert leaders or expert entrepreneurs or expert initiators. This is something that will, that they, gives them the skills that they do. So I think that the forming of the project is, a, is not hard, mm -hmm. but it takes some finesse and it takes input from skilled, experienced teachers and practitioners. And that's, I don't hear anyone, the people that I hear that coming from are the people who inspired me to go in this direction away from lecture based mm -hmm. teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Chris Lehman is the one who always comes to mind and the Science Leadership Academy in Philadelphia. And now that I've said his name, I'll put in a link to a couple of his TEDx talks because they're I mean, he's, he nails this, and I, I'm sure I've mentioned it before. When you go to his school, or the school that he, he, he was the founding principal of, there are no rooms with rows of chairs. And if you squint so you can't see who's the oldest one in the room, you can't tell who the teacher is and who the students are. And they, like, one of the projects that they did was they developed some type of um, pump or an engine for a specific use case in, in Africa. And Africa, they're using it. Like they, they solved the problem in the world that's useful. <laughs> and walking through the hallway, there's like this machine that like throws Frisbees. They built it. <laughs> and he, in one of his TEDx talks, he talks about a group of young boys were, um, oh, it's high school, so high school boys. And they were doing some expressive dance that they would perform in various places. So it's not just technical stuff. And that style of learning is, I, I think it, I, I, I bet the students coming out of his school are not fragile. I bet they're not. And yeah. I bet his budget's lower than almost any other place. Yeah, right. Yes. Well, I mean, look, there are many people even within the academy who are very critical of the way schools are run now because as the years go by, schools are increasingly um, out of tune with what's needed in the culture and the way, and the complexity of problems and the way problems need to be solved and they need to be solved in groups and by teams and with lots of diverse input. And that's certainly not the way most classrooms are organized, they're organized top down, everybody shut up, no talking. Um, and of course, to have teams, you got to have crosstalk and noise, and you have to have a tolerance for a completely different set of, of uh, human activity. And schools just, most people on the inside would tell you that schools are just 100 years out of date, but the system is so deeply entrenched. Um, and there are lots of people who would be very happy to blow the system up from the inside, but um, there's probably no one universal way to learn for everybody, but I do think that we probably get closest by having a problem to solve and putting a group of people on it to find a way to solve it. Probably seven different people would find seven different roles. Uh, and, and, and even if they failed to find a solution, they would find out a lot about themselves, what motivates them, what things interest them, how to work with other people, how to communicate with other people. And they would also go after information, the information that's needed to solve, that they needed to have to solve the problem without 
anyone having to shove it down their throats or having to memorize it. So there would be that kind of intrinsic learning and something that they would remember. And that's something that you take to whatever issue you face in life. So it becomes a life skill. Yeah, I think it's, I think it would, ideally it flips them to where we, re, I don't, I, I'm not going to be able to say this perfectly, but where learning isn't about um, the model I had was that I grew up with was teacher knows, student doesn't. Teacher right. gives information to student. Now student knows. And Regurgitates student can do. back to. Well, that's that's how they test it. But the point of the model is student learns. Now student knows how to do what the teacher did. Yes. Independent of the testing. Student doesn't know how to think the way the teacher thinks. That's not the, no, within the model, within yeah, the model, yeah, yeah, they yeah. Don't, the model does not say student doesn't know how to think for themselves. Within the model, student doesn't know, teacher knows, teacher gives information right. to student. Now student has learned what there is to learn, and right. student is now on par with the teacher. But that model just, that's, I don't know where that model came from. And I hope they would just flip over to a different model of learning is learning how to do things. And, right. And, and part of it is it's not just a brain thing. It's also a hands and full body thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, I don't know, I don't know how to put this part of it because I don't know how to put it into words. You can't really convey it. But if you do the projects, then you get it. And no one, people who come through, if you take acting classes, you learn how to act in a way that no amount of lecture could ever give you. Mm -hmm. And if you want to lead and you don't do because something... Because you have to come up with something from yourself. And no one can give that to you. You have to summon it from yourself. You have to organize yourself in a way to deliver what it is you're thinking or doing or feeling or... and project it and get it out there. No one can do it for you. And it comes through experience, it comes through practice, it comes practice. through rehearsal, yeah. it comes through um, all these things that when you get it, I don't want to act like I get it, like I am mm -hmm. have some received wisdom or something like that, but or special wisdom, but it's, I don't know how to put it into words. It, well, let's wrap up. Any closing remarks or is there anything to, to wrap this up with? No, let's blow up the schools. <laughs> Actually, when I when I was asked when I spoke at Wellesley, not the college, but the high school in Wellesley, which is, I mean, such an overachieving, high-performing public school. It's a Wellesley is basically a bedroom community for Harvard Medical School, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, has a, a large Asian population. Parents are very concerned that their kids do well and get a good education, go to name brand schools. And the high school very much reflects the, um, the goals of the parents in town. And um, very interestingly, the, the head of the high school was a fabulously interesting guy. Um, and was trying to innovate some things in this very high demand, uh, conscientious parent community. And um, we were joking and we both agreed. You know, really the only way to get the system to do what kids really need rather than having them become performing robots was to kind of blow up the system and redesign it and start all over again. So there are a lot of people within who really believe that, but just can't do it. Yeah, the, it's Kafkaesque. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's wrap up there. Okay. Kafka, good note to end on.